What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of exciting news to go over here this week. And the first news story here this week is that we have a potential horsepower number for the 2024 Mustang GT. And prepare yourself. So Ford Authority here is claiming uh, they know how much power it'll make thanks to their sources familiar with the matter. Um, and according to those sources, it'll make just 450 horsepower which is the same amount that the 2023 Mustangs make after being downgraded in 2022 because of new ratings and uh, emissions stuff. Um, went from 460 to 450, and uh, it's staying at 450, supposedly. I thought it would at least get the Mach 1s 470, um, you know, and then you would have had, you know, this dual intake thing or whatever they're going to have for the Dark Horse. They're still targeting 500 horsepower for that Dark Horse, and so hopefully they hit that target of 500 horsepower, but according to their sources, 450 horsepower, is already going to get in the 2024 Mustang, which means that, unfortunately, like a lot of other things with the S650 Mustang, it's carryover. Same as, you know, much of the body panels, much of the interior, much of the under underpinnings and everything else. It's just, it's a lot. I mean, like, I don't know. To me, it's not hard to, like, bump 10 horsepower, 20 horsepower. They have all that stuff in the Mach 1. Like, why they can't just you know have some type of improvement you know even if it means a slightly higher price tag or something you know i mean it's not hard to you know do the mach ones you know setup it's just the air intake my bullet has the same thing it's an air intake an intake manifold off the gt350 not a you know a huge ask i don't think for a next generation of a you know mustang gt but anyway um that's what they're claiming. Again, we will see. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe it will get more power. Uh, but as of right now, that's the intel is that 450 horsepower is what we're going to get with the uh, 2024 Mustang GT. So another reason I'm very happily keeping my 480 horsepower 2019 Mustang bullet. Uh, but anyway, interesting to hear that. Moving on to some other uh, sports car news here this week. Mazda this week put out a press release about their changes to their electrification plans um, that they're planning here for the 2020s. Um, and I'll cover that briefly in a minute. Uh, but first, they randomly put out two images of a sports car and basically gave no info about it. They just put out these images. Um, they said it's called the Vision Study Model. And that was it. There's a 30 minute presentation about all the electrification plans and everything they're planning on doing. And they didn't spare five seconds to even explain a little bit about what these images are like or what they're for, or, you know, what the deal is. So anyway, as you can see, it looks a little longer than the current Miata and is likely a preview of a Miata successor and even appears to have little pop-up headlights kind of as an homage to the first gen, which look really cool, along with a new take on the rear taillights there that are clearly inspired by that first generation as well and even the second generation. It also has a very curvy design here with the more narrow cabin. And uh, like all Mazda concepts, it looks fantastic so you know i mean we're still waiting for the arcs vision to get made that uh you know had a bunch of detailed patent images and clearly a lot of engineering work already done on that but i don't know where that's at or what's going on with that so i mean i don't want to say you know bank on this being the new miata and this is you know close to what you're going to see obviously they'll tone it down for production and stuff um but uh you know it just means that this is probably the design direction they're considering for the new miata and i think that's a great direction i love that little thing um the other thing i'll say is that you know don't expect the hood to be that low if they're actually planning to have it powered by gasoline because um the only motor that'll fit under a hood that low is going to be a tiny rotary engine or some other tiny engine or some kind of boxer engine from Subaru or Porsche. Um, aside from that, you know, I don't think a normal inline four is going to fit uh, under that very, very low hood. So, you know, as far as electrification thing, you know, where that might come into play, you know, it could be an electric Miata for the next generation. We'll have to see. But as far as, um, you know, what will power it. Breaking down these electrification plans briefly here. Basically, they say that they're going to be starting a transition to electrification in 2025. So they're not rushing things here. And they say a full-scale launch of battery electric vehicles won't begin until 2028. So, you know, whether they sneak in one final gas power generation here at the Miata with this thing, or if this is showing off what a future electrified Miata could be like, you know, it could go either way, in my opinion. Typically, you know, Miata generations last eight to 10 years. The NDs came out in 2015, 2025 is the beginning of their start of their transition to electrification. So to me, it makes the most sense, um, you know, especially since they're so worried about keeping the Miata light, that the production next generation Miata will probably have some type of very mild uh, hybrid setup, possibly, 
and then just run a gas engine. That is my guess as of right now. I could be totally wrong. And maybe with these, you know, changes, which they are slightly ramping up their speed of their plans for electrification, maybe part of that initiative will be to just make the Miata electric and not just have a small battery in it or something. We'll just see. But, um, you know, considering 2025 is when they're starting their switch to electrification and 2025 is when the new Miata is probably due, I think those two things lining up might not be a coincidence. We'll have to see. But um, so that's my bet is a mild hybrid setup for this. But um, anyway, yeah, it's just a fantastic little concept there. I mean, that, that is a very exciting little thing. I mean, it's also interesting, though, that it is a coupe. It's not even like, you know, a retractable hardtop. That looks like a full-blown little coupe trying to compete with, you know, the BRZ and 86 and stuff like that. Um, and that would be great, too, if they offer a true coupe, not just the RF thing, but an actual you know, fixed roof uh, for extra rigidity, better handling, and then still offer the convertible, of course, to retain the Miata's uh, original appeal. I think that would be great. You know, we'll see what they end up doing here. But anyway, a very promising little concept nonetheless, even if it is kind of puzzling the way they put it out. But uh, I'm glad to get it nonetheless. And uh, very interesting to hear those electrification plans as well. But I will elaborate a little bit more on that. So as far as their other future plans go for EVs and stuff here at Mazda, um, they're revising their electrification goal from 25% of global sales being EVs in 20 or by 2030 uh, to now a percentage somewhere between 25 and 40% which still leaves open the 25% number. So it's kind of a non-committal thing of like, we could do up to 40%, but it still could be just 25%. Um, so again, they're very, they're taking things, you know, pretty slowly and cautiously, like many of the Japanese companies are. They're um, kind of wanting to diversify and have, you know, something for everyone. And that totally makes sense. You know, this is the same thing Toyota's doing and even Honda and stuff, you know, and it makes a lot of sense. And I don't blame them for that, even though the Europeans and the Americans are kind of going in, you know, head over heels in the electric thing, you know, head first. I think, uh, you know, there's merit for both kind of, uh, you know, approaches. So Anyway, they also say in their timeline here, they plan to introduce new EVs in the later half of phase two. So you'll see the three phases there. So that means late 2026 or 2027. Um, so we've got a lot of time before the MX-30 gets any kind of electric siblings. Uh, that sounds like the MX-30 is going to be carrying the electric torch at Mazda here for at least the next, you know, three or four years, um, you know, before we actually get anything else. And um in the meantime, though, they say they are planning to introduce a new hybrid system and improve the efficiency of their gas engines, um, but they say that a multi-solution approach uh, they believe is the most effective, according to Mazda's CEO. Again, time will tell who's taking the right approach, whether they're going to, all the Japanese brands will be behind on electrification while the Americans and Europeans are sprinting towards it, or whether, you know, uh, the Japanese have the better approach. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but anyway, very interesting to hear all that. But speaking of the European brands, Fiat has revealed the 500e Abarth this week. Um, and so it gets 35 more horsepower and 25 more pound-feet of torque compared to the regular 500e. But that still only puts it at 153 horsepower and 173 pound-feet of torque total. 0 to 62 mile per hour still takes 7 seconds. And while the old uh, top Abarth 695 in Europe had 180 horsepower, Fiat says this new one laps their test track one second faster than that car, partially thanks to the instant electric power, but also thanks to its wider track, longer wheelbase, and lower center of gravity thanks to that battery pack, which um, will actually make it you know, a better handler even with its extra weight. Uh, and so uh, the battery is the same as the regular 500e, meaning a 42 kilowatt hour battery. And because of this and the extra power, it'll likely do a little less range as a result i believe on the easier wltp test cycle it's rated at like 199 miles of range so um you know expect something a little bit less and if they ever brought it to america it'd probably be you know i'm guessing 150 miles of range or something like that but anyway it still should do more than the mini cooper se which i think is like 120 miles of range or something even though the mini still is faster with 180 horsepower and that was a great fun little thing i tested and it's available now too so you don't have to wait unlike the fiat here and so one thing the albart does have that the mini doesn't um is an external sound generator this thing will have um, which is optional and can also be turned off so don't worry if you don't like the idea of this but it produces a fake exhaust sound similar to the old gas Abarth and um, it is going to be an actual speaker that 
project sound on the outside of the vehicle there um, so that yourself and passerbys can hear your sound of your Abarth here, even though it's electric. It also appears to be visually loud too here. In addition to getting this highlighter yellowy green color, you get large graphics there on the doors and, you know, pretty bold styling. But even in the more normal colors, I think it's a nice little bit of extra aggression here for the 500E, just like the last one was. Inside it gets a sportier wheel, Alcantara seats and dashboard and a couple other little touches. And it's already available to order in Europe. And while Fiat did confirm last week uh, that we'll be getting the regular 500E in 2024 here in the United States, a final decision they say hasn't been made about the Albart version yet. Um, so we'll have to see whether they send it to us here or not. Uh, but I really think that, you know, we could use more affordable, fun electric vehicles, you know, instead of every fun electric thing being in a 50 grand Having something, you know, that's a little bit more punchy and a little more fun here, you know, for, you know, something less than 50,000 would certainly be welcome, but we'll have to see. Um, and so anyway, but very cool to see that. And uh, the last little bit of Fiat news is uh, this: their CEO confirmed to Motor Trend that the 500X will not get a new generation when the current generation goes away here, which could happen as soon as 2024. And the 2024 timeline has been brought up because um, the CEO actually did say that uh, Fiat will be a one car brand. They're just going to have the 500e and that is going to be they say that's the car that everyone loves they've tried the other things and those have really not had much success the 500 is the one that um they said actually had a bigger market share than the mini cooper at one point in time for the previous generation fiat 500 whenever it was here so he's you know saying that that's their one you know minor success here in the states and they're going to stick to just that um and they also said that fiat doesn't need the u.s sales they don't care if it doesn't sell hardly anything they say it'll be basically a rounding error for them considering their enormous uh, presence all over the rest of the world and their huge sales elsewhere in the world um so they say it'll basically just be a test bed for different sales practices as far as the subscription models they want to try out and uh other you know things they're going to be trying with the 500e so it's just kind of like a fun like side hobby for them <laughs> with Fiat in the United States and the whole Stellantis empire and even Fiat's empire on its own. So, um, you know, so don't, it's going to be kind of funny because you'll have to look at the 500e and its launch as you know just them playing around basically and not them trying to be super competitive or them trying to you know come out with the best the best and most compelling thing possible you know it's just going to be kind of a trial run here and so um you know i think that's why they're fine like you know what we don't need the 500x let's kill it and um you know it's unfortunate for the dealers that are you know being dragged along with all this but um it's just going to be 500e here and 500e shows up in early 2024 so i'm assuming that soon as the 500 e is ready to be put in dealers they'll get rid of the uh, 500 x and um, that'll be the end of that so i drove the 500 x a few years back it's a fine little crossover and if you can get a good deal on one and get a good discount on one i think it could actually you know be a pretty decent value um because essentially it's just a jeep renegade with a different you know uh, clothes on and a different kind of tuning to it and you know way that it drives and stuff but a really nice little thing still nonetheless especially if you can get a good deal on it but Anyway, interesting to hear that. And one of the other Italian Stellantis uh, brands, Alfa Romeo, also has some news here. And this is kind of interesting drama a little bit. So um, Automotive News Europe is reporting that on the European media drive for the new Alfa Romeo Tenale, um, Alfa's CEO announced that the US version will no longer be offered with the regular gas engine and will be plug-in hybrid only. Um, and so... It's the higher performing, you know, plug-in hybrid. They're they're you know labeling it, and so their official reasoning here is that they want to go more aggressive on reducing emissions. Um, that they need to really reduce their emissions here in the states. Even though Alfa Romeo doesn't sell that many cars, so I can't imagine them being a huge dent in the Stellantis uh, cafe requirement, uh, you know, portfolio. But anyway, um, they're saying that's the reason. They also um, say though that they are still going to be offering the non-hybrid in Europe which kind of throws that whole argument out the window in my opinion, because Europe has the way stricter emissions regulations, way higher fines whenever you know you don't meet those regulations the stakes are way higher in Europe than they are in the States, which is why like Mercedes has been putting the U S on the back burner with all their electric car launches, because it's like, and a lot of other, other companies are doing the same thing. Cause they're like, Europe is the priority. We need to get as much stuff electrified in Europe as we can, as fast as we can. The U S who cares. And I understand that. And so the fact that Alfa Romeo is like, Oh, we need to, you know, get everything electrified in, in um, America, but still sell the less efficient gas one in Europe doesn't seem to make sense. So I'm kind of seeing through that. I don't think that's the real reason here. Personally, no offense to them, but that just doesn't seem like it holds up very well. Um, 
And so uh, a, an Alpha US spokesperson added to Car and Driver that as a premium brand, the PHEV better aligns with what our customers want in this segment as it provides an elevated experience, greater performance, and more than 30 miles of electric range. And I mean, this also just seems like a thin argument. Again, no offense to the Alfa Romeo PR representatives here in the States, but um, you know, the Hornet does the same plug-in hybrid, the same power, the same range. Um, so you're not elevating the Tenali over the Hornet by offering the same thing the Hornet does. So the Hornet is the big problem here. And I think that what they're unwilling to admit here is that Dodge kind of screwed them either uh, unbeknownst to them, or maybe this was part of the plan all along and they decided to change plans and it's not any kind of actual beef behind the scenes. Maybe this is just something that worked out amicably and that's it. But, um, clearly, you know, the Dodge Hornet, whenever that was uh, debuted here, it came out doing 268 horsepower from the non-hybrid version. The Tenali was announced with 256 horsepower. Myself and many others were like, oh, that's funny. The more premium Alpha has less power than the cheaper Hornet. I just assumed that they would bump the Tenali power up to 268 as well. I mean, clearly it's the same motor. You just, you know, have the same tune. It's not a big deal. Very easy to do. And so for them to say, actually, no, we're not going to just match the Hornet on power. We're going to drop it completely and then try and spin this as some type of elevated experience with a plug-in hybrid, which is also not unique to the Tenali and also offered with the same exact amount of power in the Hornet. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I think this is honestly just like shooting alpha dealers in the foot because, you know, they need something cheap and affordable underneath the Stelvio, but a plug-in hybrid, which is the more expensive, you know, more complicated version of the Tenale is almost certainly going to be probably as expensive as the Stelvio. And yes, it's fresher and newer, but it's also smaller than the Stelvio. It's also a class down from the Stelvio for, as from a sizing standpoint. And so, you know, it's just, I feel like if I was an alpha dealer, I'd be pretty frustrated right now because you're, you're excited for woohoo. We're going to finally have a, you know, more entry level type of thing. And then all of a sudden they're like, never mind, we're going to push it up market and make it expensive. <laughs> it's like, ah, I don't know. It just, it seems a little odd here. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's unfortunate that Dodge, you know, uh, kind of upstaged them with the Hornet here, but again, you could have the same power and it's not a big deal. And so, yeah, I don't know. I personally, in my humble opinion, not like I know anything, but I think that, you know, it's a mistake to throw out the low version of the Tenali, especially since it's still going to be offered in Europe. Um, it just seems, you know, kind of strange. But anyway, that's the news. There's only going to be one version of the Tenali here in the States, the plug-in hybrid. We don't have pricing for it yet, um, but, you know, it's uh, going to be definitely the pricier one of the two. And I mean, it sounds promising with, you know, having a, almost 300 horsepower and 30 miles of electric range and all that. It'll be great. Um, sure, I'm excited to test it out. But um, yeah, I just, it kind of throws the value idea of the Tenali out the window. And I feel like you're probably better off just getting the Stelvio, um, you know, if you don't need the freshest thing possible. So anyway, but interesting to hear that. And Mercedes this week has confirmed a few more details about the coming EQG um, that'll be debuting in 2024 in an interview with Autocar here. So um, they revealed to Autocar that it'll be using four electric motors, one on each wheel, and it'll be hooked up to a mechanical two-speed gearbox to still enable low range and high range. Those motors will also allow it to do on-demand donuts, uh, spinning in place just like the tank turn feature you get on the Rivions. Um, the other perk of these four motors is that in addition to the crazy amounts of power, um, they're also going to have extreme precision uh, as far as the power distribution off-road. As so the head of the G sub-brand said, it is incredibly precise. The individual control of drive to each wheel provides a whole new level of ability. It also said that from the start, it was decided that the electric G class should be at least as good as the internal combustion engine model, both on-road and off-road. We didn't want to compromise on capabilities. But unfortunately, there is going to be one compromise on capabilities here, and that is going to be towing, um, which obviously is a very big hurdle for any electric vehicle. Um, and they say that uh, they're actually not even sure they're going to be offering a towing ability for the new EQG, uh, just because it's going to be so much lower. Um, and it's just, you know, probably not going to make much sense. And so I think they're just going to probably avoid that altogether. And I honestly don't know how many G wagon owners actually use it to tow i haven't seen any towing ever but i mean i maybe there's it is something they do i don't know but um anyway other details here they say it'll get roughly a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack um which honestly won't take it very far even without a trailer i mean 100 kilowatt hour pack is big 
but um, considering the boxy proportions and four motors, anything else that's running even three motors has a battery way bigger than 100 kilowatt hours. Um, and uh, they did say that, I guess part of the reason for the smaller batteries, they wanted to keep the weight in check for some reason, because who cares about the weight of the G-Wagon? I'm not sure why, why they care about keeping the G-Wagon um, light, relatively speaking. Um, but I, maybe that's part of the justification for the smaller battery. Um, but they said their goal is to keep it below 7,700 pounds, which is also massively heavy and even, you know, much heavier than even the regular G wagon. But 7,700 pounds is also like 1,300 pounds lighter than the Hummer EV, which is going to kind of be a competitor, um, even though the G wagon will probably be double the price. But you know, that has like a battery that's like double the size, and that's how the Hummer is able to do you know 320 miles of range. Um, which isn't even a ton, even at that point, considering how big the battery is. So, I mean, if you have 320 miles in a vehicle that's, you know, got horrible aerodynamics and tons of off-road capability, um, you know, I mean, obviously I think the G-Wagon is going to have slightly less off-roady tires than the Hummer does, but, you know, I mean, if you do the math there and work backwards, 320 or so for the Hummer, and then you go down to half the size of the battery pack in the, in the Mercedes, you know, even with the tires and stuff, you might be lucky to get 200 miles of range out of that new, uh, you know, Mercedes vehicle. We'll have to see. They did say they're going to have more power dense battery cells um, and better battery tech, but it's still only going to be 100 kilowatt hours. So we'll see. But don't count on an electric G Wagon having much more than 200 miles of range, in my opinion. Um, otherwise, though, it sounds very promising. And Mercedes says they'll have more info on it to share it next year. So interesting to hear that. Another electric off-roader that's taking shape here is the new Scout um, that's being developed for the Scout Motors sub-brand that Volkswagen is working on here uh, for the U.S. And so there's a new website that just went live for it. It contains this new teaser image, which shows a vehicle with Bronco-like proportions and what potentially actually looks like a bench seat there in the front, um, which is intriguing. We'll have to you know wait to hear more about that but there's no other new info on it for now uh, beyond what i covered a couple of months ago uh, but there's rumors that a concept might be unveiled next year and so we'll have to see if that turns out to be true obviously i think they're saying 2026 is when these things are going to actually start production so we have a ways to go here still as far as the weight on these but all we know is it'll be you know very offer capable they're very intensely leaning on the community and wanting it to be authentic and you know be true to the you know international harvester scout you know branding um and you know the reputation there and it'll be very capable there's gonna, there's gonna be an SUV and a truck version and uh, yeah so we'll have to wait and see you know, how that all plays out but interesting to at least get one real image of something uh, instead of just the silhouette that we had previously um, and uh, even though it will be a Volkswagen sub brand don't get excited about that Scout leading to any other you know electric Volkswagen trucks or anything um, because uh, in, in new interviews with both the CEO of Volkswagen in general and the North American Volkswagen CEO um, a truck isn't a priority for Volkswagen as far as their brand goes now the Scout thing obviously they're very excited about the truck but here yeah, actually Volkswagen um, it's not a priority and so um, you know it's just kind of strange because they have shown two truck concepts in the past five years at various auto shows that were both based on the Volkswagen Atlas which is to me would make a lot of sense to just you know plop a truck bed on the back of it I mean with how popular you know, the Santa Cruz and the Maverick and stuff is I don't know why every car company isn't taking their mid-sized or compact crossovers hacking off the cargo area putting a truck bed on the back and calling it a day like I think a lot of people could be printing a lot of money just doing that, um, considering how much demand there is for the Maverick and the Santa Cruz. But anyway, Volkswagen doesn't seem interested in that. And so they uh, said, their Vol the Volkswagen CEO said, at the moment, our focus on the lineup doesn't include it. We have a clear lineup all the way through the second half of this decade, but they say that's not that's not in the plans um and uh the north american ceo gave a little more info here and potentially a little light at the end of the tunnel here saying what are the relevant segments in the u.s SUVs and pickups are we going to have a pickup i will try do we have one now no right now my focus is on strengthening the SUV portfolio i will address pickups at the right time but right now i have other issues to tackle <laughs> which i really like that very cut and dry, you know, statement there from, from that CEO that, 
totally makes sense. And hey, I get it. You know, Volkswagen's, you know, busy launching all these other things. I'm sure, you know, every car company in the US would love to sell a pickup truck. Um, and just, you know, with the chicken tax and everything, it makes it kind of tough to do that. And so it's also a, an uphill market, you know, trying to compete with the big three as far as, you know, the brands go. I mean, even the Toyota Tundra struggles. That is a true full blown thing from a massive company. Volkswagen is massive as well. But to really, you know, get the respect of truck buyers here in the States, I feel like you have to have, you know, full size, totally unique thing built for Americans. And, you know, an Atlas with a truck bed on the back will probably only do as well as a Honda Ridgeline or something would, which isn't super great. So, you know, we'll see, you know, what comes down the road. But anyway, you know, don't hold your breath for a Volkswagen truck anytime soon. Um, Jeep this week has announced the 2023 Compass and that it'll be getting a new engine to go along with the new interior it just got for 2022. So nice improvements here for the Compass towards the end of its life here. So they're tossing out the old 2.4 liter Nash, the aspirated four cylinder and putting in the two liter turbo four that other Mopar products get. But in this one, it's tuned way down to 200 horsepower and 221 pound feet of torque. This is the same motor the Hornet gets, for example, which has, you know, again, 268 horsepower. Obviously, that's more performance oriented, but still, I mean, this is a big drop down, but still a nice improvement over the old uh, motor in the in the compass because this is now 23 more horsepower and 49 more pound feet of torque, which is really significant. That's basically, you know, 25% more torque than before. It's also now paired up to the eight speed automatic instead of the nine speed they used to use. And all compasses are all wheel drive now as well. So the front wheel drive option has been dropped. Um, they also get a bigger rear anti roll bar and retuned steering. And the base price does also go up by about $2,700 as a result of dropping that, you know, base front wheel drive uh, model. But, um, and that does also give it a starting price now of $30,000, which is also kind of tough to wrap your head around considering the compass name started as something based on the Dodge Caliber from way back when, which was a very cheap, you know, little thing. And the compass was also a cheap little thing. And obviously it still is, it's now much nicer than it was before, but still just the fact that a compass now starts at 30 grand, is kind of crazy and still makes me think there's a little bit of a Jeep tax there, um, considering, you know, there's other crossovers in that segment for, you know, a good bit less. But anyway, um, as far as the actual changes go from model year to model year, it's not a bad bump. So uh, pricing is only up between $600 and $1,200 for the new engine, um, you know, and so not a bad increase, especially considering there's also price some of the inflation increase baked into that increase as well. So I think it's pretty reasonable considering all the improvements but it's just you know crazy how much everything's ballooning in price here even uh you know jeep compass being 30 grand to start and anyway they're available to order now if you're interested and the next generation lincoln nautilus has leaked out uh due to some images that were found by uh, ford authority here that were filed to the chinese government for regulatory approval so in typical lincoln fashion it's really sleek and attractive and also has grown a bit now being over three inches longer and growing slightly in all the other dimensions as well and don't get too excited about this though because the future of the Nautilus is not certain here and actually seems pretty um, pretty unpromising uh, if you're someone who's a fan of the Lincoln Nautilus so um, you know this might just be for China because uh, the Canadian factory that currently builds the North American Nautilus and Ford Edge they will be ending production of those two models in 2023 which is already announced by Ford uh, to make way for a new electric uh, Ford Explorer and a new electric uh, Lincoln Aviator so it's been a while since we've heard those plans, so those plans could have changed, but if those plans haven't changed, then the Nautilus and the Edge will be dying off here, uh, you know, in 2023 with no successor unless they swap it to another plant somewhere. But, um, you know, they haven't announced any plans like that. They could surprise us, um, you know, and, and we'll just have to see what they end up doing with the Edge and the Nautilus. Um, you know, obviously they're still selling decently well for, you know, how old they are and stuff. Um, so we'll see what ends up happening with them, but... You know, we could get this new version that totally would be, you know, a great thing. But obviously, you know, they buy, they, people buy a lot more Lincolns in China than they do in the U.S. here. So us getting the short end of the stick certainly makes sense. And, you know, it could just be that they slim down the lineup here in the States and drop the Nautilus as well as the Edge. We'll have to see. Uh, but anyway, very interesting to uh, at least see that for China and, uh, you know, very promising, at least even for future Lincoln SUVs here. Even if, you know, we don't get this styling here in the Nautilus, you know, this kind of stuff, you'll probably see some of these other styling cues here on the Aviator and the Navigator for the next generation versions as well. And so anyway, cool to see that. One Chinese model that uh, we will be getting here in the U.S., which is actually kind of a surprise, is the new Buick and Vista. And so on a conference call, GM's president said that it's already in production in China, off the design of the Buick Wildcat, getting ready for the United States here as well. Just a beautiful addition to the Buick lineup. 
kind of said it very casually, nonchalantly, like we already knew that, but we didn't already know that. That was new news. And so no big ta-da kind of announcement, just like, oh yeah, you know, we got this in Vista and it'll be great. And it's like, wait, what? Like, it's kind of funny. They uh, just kind of casually dropped that. So anyway, he didn't provide any other info or, you know, anything like that. Um, so it's unclear what the plans are as far as how it's going to get here, whether they're going to export the Chinese built ones, because those ones are actually built in China. So whether, you know, China China builds them and they export them here to the States or if they figured out some place to build a US version here in North America somewhere. You know, I'm not sure what their plans are for that, but uh, in China, it runs a one and a half liter turbo four for 181 horsepower along with the CVT. And also you might see the GS badges on the uh, you know vehicle here in the pictures. Unfortunately, that's just an appearance package in China, the GS branding, which I feel like I know, I know there's probably not too many diehard Buick fans out there that respect the GS name anymore, but I'm sure those fans are going to be upset about the fact that the GS thing is simply an appearance package at this point and, you know, isn't an actual performance thing like it used to be just a few years ago on the Regal. Um, so we'll see about how that all plays out here. I certainly hope the GS uh, is more than just a, an appearance package on future Buicks because there have been trademark trademark that uh, you know things that unfiled as far as the gs branding for other things and so hopefully it means more than just appearance stuff in the future but anyway uh the little invista will be a nice little thing to bridge the gap i guess you know between the encore gx and the uh you know other one above it which i think is called the envision there's so many different little buick crossovers i feel like there's they're splitting up the pie a little bit too much here, but, you know, we'll see. I mean, if this thing looks, you know, very nice and, you know, hopefully it'll sell well for them. And so anyway, I'm sure we'll have more info on that here relatively soon. CarBuzz this week has uh, found out that Lexus has filed a trademark for the UX300 name. Um, and so the same trademark has also been filed in Europe and Australia. And so the UX is only about four years old, so it's not quite ready for a new generation, I don't think. Um, so... There's two lines of thinking. Either this is preparing for a new generation, which might actually come sooner than we're expecting, or this is going to be another little refresh for the current generation UX, and it'll basically just get the more powerful hybrid setup that was just debuted here in the 2023 Corolla Hybrid. Um, so um, that would mean uh, 194 horsepower if it got the same thing as the Corolla instead of 181 horsepower that it currently gets. So I guess the extra bump in power could warrant them, you know, bumping the name up from the UX250 we have currently up to the 300. Um, since those names don't really be, they don't really seem to be connected to anything anymore. Um, I guess they could do that. You know, there's also some other outlets they're hypothesizing that's going to get a punchier hybrid setup from like the RAV4 and the NX, but I don't think that setup's going to fit in this tiny little UX here. Um, so I wouldn't count on that. I think it's just going to probably be, you know, it gets the Corolla's bump or... They're just going to, you know, have this for the next generation version and the next generation will have, you know, a little bit more power and be bigger and stuff. And then they can call it the UX 300 and have a little bit more of a justification behind that, you know, higher branding. We'll have to see. Uh, but anyway, interesting to hear that. And then the last little bit of news is also about Lexus here. So the uh, Lexus LS is going to be in the new touchscreen Lexus interface infotainment system for 2023 here. So it's one of the last Lexus models here to throw out the controller pad, but I'm glad, you know, they're all sw switching over here to the touchscreen. It's a 12.3 inch screen and uh it's been brought forward as well to provide easier access to it compared to the old screen integration which is a little bit deeper in the dash there it also gets wireless apple carplay and wireless android auto along with a total of six usb ports now which is more than before and they've also made some changes to the tuning of the steering suspension brakes and transmission to provide a better ride and handling and all these improvements only raised the price of the ls by 285 dollars now uh, starting at 78,685 dollars and lastly, I want to thank all of you who are members of the Matt Moran Motoring Club. So we didn't have any new members join this week, but I want to give a huge thank you and shout out to Isaac Falvey for being a member here for many months now. I hope you're enjoying the perks and I really appreciate the support. And for anyone else who would like to become a member of the channel, uh, there's going to be a join button here on the video page and on the channel page. There's also a link in the description if you'd like to join and to get access to all the perks uh, that the members enjoy. And also for those of you who are members, stay tuned. There's going to be a live stream here this weekend. I'll be doing it on Sunday morning slash afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, and so definitely stay tuned for that. And uh, members will be getting the priority answering um, during that live stream as well. So another perk uh, that uh, I think a lot of you members do enjoy. So thank you all for your support, though. And thank you all very much for watching. I hope you have a good rest of your holiday weekend here. And I'll uh, see you guys in the next one. Take care.